At 7.30 in the morning of February 2nd, 1922, director William Desmond Taylor would be found in his flat, shot dead, and the last person to see him alive would be silent film actress Mabel Normand. This would not be her first scandal. Mabel seemed kind of attracted to trouble like that glowfish scene in Finding Nemo. In fact, only a few years after Taylor's murder, she would be wrapped up in another bloody incident. And by 1930, she would be found dead at the young age of only 38. Mabel Norman's life was often one of tragedy, well documented by this out-of-control media that really was less interested in the truth and more interested in attention-grabbing headlines. Again, a big part of my journey here, it seems to be finding out how little things have changed in a hundred years. But there was no doubt that a lot of her suffering was self-inflicted. She was infamously a party animal whose drug addictions and bad lifestyle choices, these all compounded and played a big role in her fall from grace in Hollywood. Despite all this, she was remembered fondly and during her heyday rose to become one of the most prominent silent film stars and leading ladies in the film world. Her crowning achievement would be the highest grossing film of 1918 that captured not just Norman's main appeal to audiences, but also her skills as a silent comic and perhaps most importantly, her prowess behind the camera as 1918's Mickey became the highest grossing movie produced by a woman. Mabel Norman would be born in New Brighton, New York. Like many silent stars such as Charlie Chaplin or Mary Pickford, Mabel came from a very poor family. Her good looks would land her the modest role as a background actor in an assortment of videograph films, her first known credit being in The Indiscretions of Betty, followed by a background role in D.W. Griffith's Fate Turning. Videograph Studios failed to recognize her as a leading talent, and that allowed D.W. Griffith to come along and just kind of steal her away. In 1911, he would produce Her Awakening, with Mabel in the lead role. It was this role that introduced her to Max Sennett, founder and producer at Keystone Studios. With this, the two began this kind of roller coaster of a love affair. This relation was likely at least partially responsible for opening a lot of doors for Norman as she began landing more and more leading roles. With Keystone Studios, Norman mostly played these damsels in distress, youthful characters full of spunk and energy, and not shy about, you know, showing a little bit of skin, at least as far as the pearl-clutching 1910s were concerned. Despite her typecasting as helpless damsels, she regularly showed that she had this willingness to perform her own stunts. It was this sense of just adventurous recklessness that really drew viewers to her, but it's also this thrill-seeking that often landed her in trouble with the tabloids, especially when it came to her highly publicized party attitude. Now, all of this, you know, drugs and parties and stuff, this sounds like pretty standard behavior for young Hollywood stars, even in the modern day. But to early 1900s sensibilities, this was seen as outright scandalous behavior. And her personal life wasn't the only thing sensationalized, with her relationship to Max Sinnott eventually even being turned into a musical called Mac and Mabel in 1974. Mac found Mabel to be this wild and uncontrollable spirit, while Mabel often found Mac in bed with other young starlets. Needless to say, this entire relationship was kind of just this big powder keg. But Mabel did find unique opportunities with Sinnott, such as the chance to direct her own movies, including the first film to feature Charlie Chaplin's iconic tramp character in Mabel's Strange Predicament in 1914. The lovesick Max Sinnott even built Mabel her own studio and co-produced Mickey with her in 1918. The film had a delayed release, but this delay actually proved to be an unforeseen boon, as it allowed for this extended marketing campaign. This resulted in Mickey becoming a massive hit as it grossed $8 million on a $25,000 budget. And the film's success, it's not really just in 1918, though, because in 1921, Max Sinnott would re-release the film to become the highest ticketed movie of the entire silent era, beating out Birth of a Nation in total seats sold. As a movie, Mickey, it's not really anything new. It's again playing with the rags-to-riches story template that was really popular in the 1910s. In the film... The character Mickey is the daughter of a miner whose mind has all but dried up as he falls ill. This would be bad enough, but his daughter is also kind of this hyperactive, just frumpy, wild child. When a young miner comes to town, he, for some reason, not really clear, instantly falls in love with her, which is expressed by him creepily stalking on her as she's skinny dipping. But I guess he's good looking, so that makes it okay, I guess? You know, 1910s morality could sometimes be... A little weird. On one hand, pearl clutching one minute, and on the other hand, just allowing people to be total creeps the next and going, that's fine. Anyways, 
Before the young man can properly romance her, Mickey is whisked off to live with her rich aunt and learn some manners. Here the narrative switches gears to become a very Cinderella type story, with a wicked aunt who is supposed to be looking after her while really only being interested in her for her family mine and money. And the actress who plays the aunt does seem to be having fun with the villainy. When the mine is revealed to be dried up, she puts Mickey to work in rags. Mickey could probably be best described as Cinderella with ADHD. There's many familiar scenes here. There are scenes of Mickey scrubbing the floors or making her own dress to sneak off to a ball and charm the love interest. This attempt even ends with her cousin tearing up her dress in a jealous rage. All of these are clear similarities to the Disney version, but predating it by about 30 years. The young prince, sorry, minor, arrives, and what do you know? He's actually already betrothed to Mickey's cousin, Elsie. What are the odds? I mean, <laughs> there's only five people in the world, I guess. And if you think this will all lead to just some jealous shenanigans, you'd be right. The aunt begins to fear that Mickey is stealing the rich benefactor away from her daughter, so she tries to send Mickey home, right before learning that her mind has suddenly struck gold and she's filthy rich again. The aunt rushes to bring her back before attempting to entice her into just this gross romance with her own creepy cousin, Reggie, which is... Ugh, no. <laughs> Why? Understandably, this doesn't really get Mickey all, you know, I guess, excited. <laughs> and she dodges all of Reggie's just really creepy and very aggressive advances. Meanwhile, the hot young miner is trying to figure out how to get out of his betrothal to Elsie, so he can instead marry a hyperactive and, you know, irresponsible child. So he goes to his lawyer to get some good old-fashioned advice. The lawyer, I guess, tries to give him the help in hand and tells him that he lost all of his investments. So naturally, the miner tries to get it all back by betting on a horse race. On the plus side, the recklessness does cause Elsie to break off her engagement, so... Yay? Mickey realizes that the bet has all been fixed, so naturally, she decides to disguise herself as a jockey, steals one of the horses, and plans to compete in the race herself. Instead of, you know, doing the logical thing and just going and telling an authority figure or, you know, the police. However, this is probably the high point of the movie, with it being authentically well shot and having good tension. Mickey ultimately does lose the race right before the finish line, and the miner, he loses everything. But just in case you think this movie is some sort of, you know, early female empowerment, don't be getting ahead of yourself. The movie climax really shifts gears and forces Mabel back into her role as, you know, a damsel in distress. Reggie basically attempts to, you know, leading to a fight between Reggie and the young miner. It doesn't exactly feel, you know, in tone with the rest of the movie, where Mabel is portrayed as a self-sufficient adventurer, while her love interest is kind of, you know, just milk toast. It really is here just so the white bread boring dude gets to have his heroic moment. And this is not uncommon for this era for female characters to lose their agency in the third act, but it is still disappointing to see. In the end, Mickey is married to the miner, and the lawyer reveals that he never lost any of the investments at all, and it was all just a ploy to break off the marriage between him and Elsie. And frankly, worst lawyer ever. Disbar this man. <laughs> this dude almost lost everything. It's still treated like a glad I could help you out moment. <laughs> Fantastic. Great stuff. The movie itself, it's, it's fine. It's a warmed over plot done to death and it really leans into the slapstick without the same creative energy as the Charlie Chaplin films or even Mabel's later films that she did with Fatty Arbuckle. The movie can be tonally inconsistent. Going from broad slapstick to, you know, just innocent, exciting action to someone literally trying to, you know, uh, yeah, all of this wrapped around a generic love triangle or I guess, I guess love square. Anyways, it's easy to predict everything that's going to happen. So why is this movie so well remembered? Well, right after this film came out, all kinds of hell sort of broke loose. Despite the success of Mabel's film, her studio went under after this one film thanks to a shakeup with her parent company, Triangle Pictures. Then Mac and Mabel's love affair came to an end as Mabel signed with Goldwyn Pictures. Mabel then would drunkenly marry Luz Cody, the actor who played Creepy Reggie, in a classic Las Vegas fashion where they kind of just got plastered and then woke up the next morning with rings on their fingers. Her drug and drinking problem got even worse before director and friend William Desmond Taylor practically had to force her into rehab. Then her other business partner, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle would be accused of murder, resulting in most of her most popular films being pulled out of screenings due to just association. Worst of all, 
her friend William Desmond Taylor, that did so much to try and get her back on track, would be mysteriously murdered in 1922, and Mabel would become the chief suspect for a very short time. The case would end as still one of the great real-life unsolved murder mysteries. And we're not done with her yet either, because in 1924, her chauffeur would shoot a well-known millionaire, Cortland S. Dines, with her own gun. Okay, this is just endless bad luck at this point. Though Dines does survive, I still think it's safe to say Mabel Norman kind of won the crap lottery. Scandal after scandal destroyed Norman's on-screen image as this adventurous, innocent young girl. Throw in one last scandal where she was falsely accused of adultery, add kind of as salt in the wounds the fact she then lost her libel suit against that person, and Mabel, she was done. She would soon after die of tuberculosis at a very young age of 38. Her life was perhaps an early example in Hollywood of the phrase, it's better to burn out than to fade away. And Mabel, she really hasn't faded away. Not completely. Mickey stands as an example of the actor at her height and all she was capable of. As by the numbers as the story was, she had a natural magnetism and energy. And the massive success of the film, both in 1918 and in 1921, showed that audiences loved her crazed energy. Sometimes a singular performance can rise above the generic story it's in. And Mickey is a reminder of all the charm that Norman had, especially as an early icon and her skills as an early female storyteller. This should remain her legacy, above all the tabloid attention-grabbing headlines and a career cut short. But those, those are just my thoughts on Mabel Normand and Mickey, the highest grossing film of 1918. Please like and subscribe, and as always, keep those reels turning. Thank you.